What's up, guys? Welcome to another episode of Logos Podcast. This is Max. This is Joey. And on today's episode, we've got an art piece which we're going to break down for you and an artiste Caravaggio, which we're going to also talk about and get down in there because we think art's important and we'll talk about why we think art's important. Art is important, but before we get into that... What's the name of the art piece we're going to talk about? It's called The Raising of Lazarus. The Raising of Lazarus. I was having trouble before starting the episode and saying The Raisin. Which is southern slang, or the rising, which is also not the name not of the, the piece. right word. It's the raising, the of raising of Lazarus, Lazarus by Caravaggio. That's right. So we're going to talk about that. Yes, and I just wanted to preface this episode for our, our audio listeners because we are a podcast first. That if you're listening to this, it's going to be hard maybe to to follow along for some of it, but to to ease the burden of trying to enter into this art piece with us, I'm going to place the painting as the icon image on the podcast platform. So if you're on Apple or Spotify or Google Podcasts, you'll see the image hopefully pop up on your phone as you're listening to it. So you can kind of refer back to it. Even though if you're, I just want to say, if you're driving and you can't take time to look at this image, this episode will still be worth listening to. And then you can go look at it later, I think. Yes. Right? That's, that's right. Absolutely. And then you could also just watch us on YouTube because it's going to be up on YouTube. Correct. And it'll be, we'll put it on Instagram. Did you already say that? Yes, I did. No, I didn't. We'll put it on Instagram. It's going to be on Instagram. So just want to let you all know that. Um, but we think that art is awesome and worthy of our conversation, even just a little bit. But before we get into that, Joey, ¿Cómo estás? You always ask me that question in Spanish. That is true. Y estoy bien, gracias a Dios. Qué bueno. Um, I'm good. Let's see. What's new in my life? We just had a great class. So this, I mean, Max and I, oh, we should talk about Wednesday mornings. Wednesday mornings, Max, Sam. Yeah, you guys remember Sam. And myself and one other of our uh, confers. I don't know why I just said the confers. One of our other classmates. We don't have first period class, which like never happens at seminary. That's true. So we've all been going to the gym together on Wednesday mornings. And that's been a lot of fun. I've enjoyed that. It has been great. Um, I'm obviously in there lifting heavier than joey is <laughs> just, but uh just getting massive that's beside, that's beside the point here um so that was that's always a good way to start wednesday and then we had our joe and i in literature class today mm-hmm. which is such a good class and then we had our class on aquinas's treatise on evil which has also been a great class yeah it's been pretty intense i, I have to be honest with you i leave the class and like my brain is mush yeah like kind of an existential crisis every yeah. class We've been doing it outside though, so that's been it's been beautiful weather here. Yeah. Say it's been beautiful weather here. It has been beautiful weather Thank here. You. I have to be honest with you all. Thank you. Um, and then, other than that, I don't know. Tomorrow's the feast of the exaltation of the cross, which is big deal. So that's pretty sweet. Expect yeah. some graphics from Logos Podcast on social media. So oh there's yeah, that. that's right. And yeah, so that's kind of how I'm doing. How are you doing? Good, man. Uh, also, like I said, like we said, like you said. I shredded a workout this morning. That was great. Shredded. Uh, had class. Um, I'm now relaxing. I am also a little tired, so I have accompanying me on today's episode, un tasse du café, as they say in French, which is a cup of coffee. And uh, so that'll be accompanying me throughout this ride. I have a question. Okay. What do you put in your coffee? Because that smells Ooh. delicious. So this is a Keurig K-cup. Particularly. That's it? So, are you going to let me talk? Or <laughs> sorry, you? sorry. Okay. Uh, so, this is Dunkin' Donuts French Vanilla. I've tried very many K-Cups. And listeners, please, if you have your comment or uh, suggestions as to what I should uh, buy next. I've been, I've been drinking uh, Dunkin' Donuts French Vanilla for a while. And then I put, listen to this, I put one creamer, one sugar. And that's my move. One cream, one sugar. I used to put no cream, no sugar. But I started to recognize that soft. I got, well, that's not the word I would use. Okay. That's not the word I would use. What I would say is that I got smart. Okay. Because I started <laughs> noticing that I started drinking my coffee for like purely utilitarian purposes and not savoring it at all. And so now I'm at least, and it's also stopped me from drinking so much coffee. I don't know if that makes sense. You would think better flavoring it now. Yeah. Cause like, I'm like, like this cup, it used to be like, I'm going to drink it just to have energy. But now I'm like sitting, I'm like, oh, this tastes pretty good. I don't want to finish it so quickly. I see. Yeah. That makes, that sense. makes sense. I don't know. Yeah. It's, well, it smells good. So thanks for bringing that into the atmosphere. Um, we're not <laughs> sponsored by Dunkin' Donuts, by the way. This but is if not, you want to, you are a Catholic a organization. So here we are. Are they a Catholic organization? That's what I've heard. Shout out Dunkin' Donuts. That's right. So do sponsor us, although you are not as of now. 
That's um, life, man. So yeah, chilling. My dad got, he solved his, he didn't have a coffee drinking problem, but he said the amount of coffee he drank every day was reduced dramatically when he got a Yeti because the Yeti kept his coffee hot. So hot. And then he realized that the only reason he kept drinking so much coffee was because he was trying to drink it before it got cold. Mm. And then so once he got a cup, once he got a Yeti that kept it hot, he just, uh, now he just has like one cup a day. Yeah, you know, I actually stopped using the Yeti because it worked so well. Keeps it too hot. It almost. is. Yeah, I mean, truly. Um, same thing. I used to have a Yeti cooler. Yeti just products are just like overpowered, we're I think. also not sponsored by Yeti. No, we're not. Um, but they're overpowered, I think, for the common use. They're great products, but overpowered. And so here we are. Well, that's good. I'm glad you're doing well. I'm glad you got sugar in your coffee and creamer. Mm -hmm. And and uh, full of, and I'm just full of life. Full of life and energy. That's really the reason you're happy for me. Um, happy future Mexican Independence Day that's coming up. So I just wanted to. That's right. Wait, so are we not independent yet? <laughs> is, that, is that are you denying? Or the celebration <laughs> of your previously acquired independence is, is coming up. Thank you. And I want to congratulate you on that. Thank you. Just Although I will say I'm Mexican. A, I'm Mexican-American, so, you know, I, I benefit from the fruits of my forefathers. Uh, not so much myself being able to celebrate it rightly so. But here we are nevertheless. Uh, we will be making tacos, drinking some tequila hopefully this weekend. Horchata. And horchata is going to be present, no doubt. Salsita, verde y roja. Are we inviting guests to the seminary? No, we're not. Not this year around. Nobody. Nobody. In the past, we've gotten to invite guests to our... Yeah. Mexican Independence Day parties. Oh, well. Yeah. Well, should we talk about this painting? Yeah, I think it's important. All I right. Think, I think it's so important. why are we talking about this painting again? Um, one of the reasons we have on our outline is it literally says, because art is sick. <laughs> that's what it says. And so that's one of the reasons. That we're <laughs> art is sick. Dude. Art is sick. Art is beautiful. I was actually, last night, before I went to bed, I was reading uh, JP2's artist, uh, Letter to Artists, that he composed, ah. I believe, in 1992. Wow. And uh, I recommend all you read it. It's a short letter to any creatives. Uh, so it's a letter to artists, and he talks about the importance of art and culture. He talks about the importance of the artist and the, the artist's role within society. And uh, I was just kind of reminded of, of the beauty of art and the necessity for it in a culture because, as we've said before, man does not live off bread alone. Ah, uh, yeah. And so we're kind of composed um, in such a way that we need things outside of just a material world to satisfy our hearts. And so in that way... Art is sick. Yeah, it is sick. And it's amazing how how truth is communicated differently through different mediums. So That's like, right. We were actually talking about this today in our class. Like, It's one thing to try to approach the truth about reality about your life by thinking philosophically, very logically. And mm -hmm. there's merit to that, and it's very important sometimes. But then you get a diff like if you read a story, if you mm -hmm. read literature, you come to understand truth in a new way that thinking philosophically couldn't. And then so too looking at a piece of art truth is communicated through that in a way that's distinct from those other ways yeah and so i think personally that's one of the things that's made jordan peterson so popular right so he's a psychologist by trade yeah and so he could very well lay out the scientific evidence as to why the processes of your brain are doing what they do and you are doing what your brain is telling you to do but instead what he tends to do is lean on carl jung and his archa archetypal kind of sketch of, uh, sketch of reality, which is deeply intertwined with uh, Romanesque literature. Stories. And stories, yeah. narratives in general. Mm -hmm. And so he kind of, oh, that's, a, to, I think, to just yeah. exalt your point all the more. It's like there's a there's this deep desire in us to, to enter into the narrative of existence rather than just the science behind what's explaining it. I also think that one of the reasons we're talking about it is because we believe, and we've mentioned it before, what Dostoevsky said, that beauty will save the world. Amen. And... Uh, so, yeah, I think that's another reason why. And I also just think that beauty is a disarming way for us to, to bring the gospel into people's life. It's funny. Max loves art and loves beauty. And I was like, we always do this section on our podcast. Like, why are we talking about what we're talking about? And we've talked about this a million times, but you give Max leeway to talk about art, and he just, like, on our outline, just <laughs> wrote, wrote a bunch of stuff. He's like, because art is so awesome. Nobody's like, talking just, about it, you know? <laughs> like, I love art. It's so good. <laughs> but it's true. It's true. Um, anything else? Any other musings you have that you want to share at this moment? Yes. They're valued. I mean, I'm actually being enriched by them. I am of the opinion, and I think there's grounds for this, that civilizations can often be measured by the art that they produce. 
Uh-huh. JP2 you know, said stuff like that. Right. right so yeah. actually on one of his visits, so he said that, but I think that's the case. Just generally, um, when he came to the U.S., you know, all these bishops and cardinals and priests and everybody was like, look how great the U.S. Catholic Church is doing. Look at this. Look at that. Look, we got we built this building and look, we have this foundation. And he was like, that's great, but where's the art? Mm-hmm. Right. And again, we've said that antidote before on here, but I think it just proves a point that the human heart and the standard to which the human heart is living is expressing what it creates. Yeah. And it's true in our in our culture, if you want to call it a culture. Yeah. We're much more about productivity, efficiency, making money. Mm-hmm. JP2 himself, I'm thinking he was an artist. He was a he was an actor. He yeah. acted, he was a poet. Screenwriter. Screenwriter, right? He wrote plays and stuff. So Yeah. Yeah. So that's why we're talking. That's why if you're tuning into Logos Podcast for the first time and you're like, why are these two seminarians talking about this piece of art? That's uh, kind of why, because it's a big deal. But also, talking about efficiency, the reason why we're also talking about it is because Joey (laughs) was actually studying this art piece in order to compose a paper for his biblical yeah, so for our class on uh, John, on the Gospel of John. I'm Not little John, Gospel of John. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah okay. Um, in our class on Jovanine literature, we're reading the Gospel of John. We have to write an exegesis paper, which is uh, a deep study of part of the biblical text. And I'm actually researching this scene, uh, this the chapter 11 of John's Gospel, which is the story of the raising of Lazarus, which maybe is a good segue for us to get into before yeah. we... Uh, well, let's talk about Caravaggio first, should we? I think it's important. Okay, so the, before we talk about John 11, we talk about what this piece of artwork is depicting. We should first talk about the artist because that helps us understand the artwork a little bit. So who is this guy? So first, I think it's interesting to point out that his name is actually not Caravaggio, which is kind of his picked up painter's name or pseudonym. I need a painter's name. Well, his is Michelangelo. Marisi. That's, his, that's his real name. Michelangelo Marisi. So you can't use that as your... That's kind of like if I was trying to be a famous basketball player, but my name at birth was LeBron. It's like I'd have to change it. Like, I can't be okay, LeBron Okay, you can't. There can't famous. be two LeBrons. Okay, that's not... <laughs> I wonder if that was part of the logic well, of I, changing his name. And I think Michelangelo was just a, just a famous name. And he was influenced by Michelangelo, He was right? deeply, yeah. yeah. So and I think that's another part of his, his uh, biography here is that he was... He was part of the renaissance renaissance school of art which to be fair at the time there weren't many other options but he was a part of that um he was catholic uh so but yeah so being part of the renaissance school of art means that you're influenced by people like michelangelo so he was italian he was from italy right that's right 16th century Mm -hmm. which means 1500s for all those out there who that who confuses who get confused by those designations as i do i'm not sure where he was born but I do know that his career really took off in Milan, Italy. Okay. In fifteen uh, seventy ish. Okay. Um, but again, going back to he was deeply influenced by these schools of thought of people like Michelangelo, Titian, Lorenzo, Lotto, and uh, here's another name that I found on uh, Sketch Out, uh, Tinoretto. So there it is. In case you're interested, maybe that'll be my painter's name, Tinoretto. Um, and okay, so fifteen seventy. That's I'm thinking Martin Luther nailed the 95 theses to the door of the Cathedral of Wittenberg in 1517. So Mm -hmm. this is after the Protestant Reformation. Did that have any effect on Caravaggio's painting? It did. And actually, there were a few times where he was exiled to and from Rome um, because of of the Reformation. And the Council of Trent, which would have been the council leading or trying to make sense of this, uh, put some restrictions and some guidelines into what could and could not be produced when it comes to art. Oh, wow in order to portray the truths of the faith and to protect them. Yeah. And so he was part of that discussion. How do I, you know, Caravaggio was probably asking myself, how do I as an artist live according to the standards of the church? Interesting, yeah. And so there was certainly some things there. I, I, I thought some things worth bringing out of this artist uh, strengths particularly were the contrasts. So he's known for having high contrast. You'll notice that the darks are really dark right Mm -hmm. in his paintings but the brights are really bright which we'll even bring out in this painting some they're very scenic very dramatic um and they're very detailed when he paints his characters and in fact i myself is i'm deeply um influenced by caravaggio's paintings in my photography so i do it as a hobby and i'm deeply influenced by by caravaggio he's got some beautiful paintings really what are some of his famous ones uh the beheading of john the baptist is one of his most famous one that one's um the death of a virgin Kind of infamous. Because is that about 
the death of like Mary the Virgin? Uh, I'm not sure, but I but I think so. I'm not sure. Okay. I think that's the reason. It was an infamous painting. I actually, that's a good question. I'm not sure, but so those are two that come to mind. You know, there, there's another one, the Adoration of the Shepherds. That's a beautiful. Ah, that's image right. Of, like the shepherds coming to mm-hmm. adore Our Lady and the Infant Jesus. Yeah. Um, the Call of Saint Matthew. That's another really good Caravaggio. Oh my gosh, piece. I forgot about that. Yeah, piece. he's like big deal. He's got some bangers. And uh, some bangers. Some bangers. Wow. Proud of you, Joey, for using contemporary slang. Hey, man, don't make it less cool by making it a thing. Oh. <laughs> Joe, you suck for using it. Why are you using it like, like, like that? Uh, yeah, I, I also think he's, he's making a resurgence in a lot of people. So here's the thing about artists, right? When an artist is great, like any piece of literature, like any piece of music, they withstand time. They stand the test of time, and they're obviously guys that are deeply studied, people that are, are, you know, women that are deeply studied, and then influencing the contemporary arts, and I think he's no exception to that rule. Yeah. So uh, I think that's another reason he's worth bringing up. And speaking about being deeply studied, what's evident whenever I, you know, see paintings from Michelangelo or people like Caravaggio is that these guys were not just artists. These guys were theologians. Like, these guys knew the scriptures. They knew theology. They had probably studied St. Thomas Aquinas and... Mm. And they knew, I mean, they knew philosophy. They, cause, and the reason I say that is, as we're going to get into, these deep theological truths are depicted in their artwork. Yeah, and actually, when JP2 wrote that letter to artists, he was talking about that. He, has, he, he says, you know, you as an artist, you as a creative, have the capacity to draw man into these profound realities through your yeah. illustrations. Yeah, you know, which is, it's a godlike thing to do, to exactly. create signs that draw people towards yeah. heaven it's what we say sacramental it's both worldly and also not yeah you know yeah there's a deep logic that's not seen but yet you use the logic of creation to express these realities cool so yeah, that's man. caravaggio that's yes, our artist for the day and the piece of art that we're going to be studying looking at examining reflecting on is the raising of lazarus as we've mentioned so this is a depiction of a scene from the gospel of john um it takes place in the 11th chapter of John's gospel, and it's kind of the climactic event in the first half of John's gospel, right? So uh, the first half of John's gospel, Jesus is performing all these signs, right? There's seven of them, but it starts with the wedding at Cana. There's the healing of the man born blind, right? There's, And it's leading up, leading up, leading up. And this is like the big revelation of Jesus' divinity. And it's ultimately what it's this miracle. It's the performance of this miracle and the reaction to it that lead to the Jewish Sanhedrin convening and planning to put him to death. That's right. So this is like the climactic event. Jesus, um, after having uh, left the Jerusalem area, after having left Bethany because the Jews were already getting frustrated with him, um, he gets word that his friend Lazarus, the brother of Martha and Mary, is sick. Mm. And Jesus, and not like sick, not like sick, dude, <laughs> but like actually, sick. he's ill. He's he's suffering from an illness, and um, Jesus. It's weird. The text says because he loves, because he loved Lazarus, he waited two days before going to attend to him, and in those two days, Lazarus died, and then Jesus decides to go to. So, so that you think, okay, like, what is Jesus doing there? Why is he, if he loved Lazarus, why is he allowing him to, to die? Why isn't he going to his help immediately? Well, anyway, Jesus shows up in Bethany and Martha, so Lazarus is dead. He's been dead for four days. And Martha, Lazarus's sister, runs out to meet Jesus. And she says to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But, but she has faith in Jesus. She, she's come to know him. She says, even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. And Jesus is like, um, your brother will rise. Hmm. And Martha thinks he's talking about like the resurrection, like in heaven, right? Yeah. He thinks she's, she thinks he's talking about, okay, yeah, like after we all die, yes, I'll get to see my brother again. And she says, I know he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. And this, Jesus says this famous line. He says, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even if he dies, will live. And everyone who believes in me and lives will never die. So, and then Martha expresses, she says, yes, Lord, I believe this. So she expresses her faith in Jesus. And then Jesus moves to the scene of the tomb, right? There's, Mm. um, Lazarus is in the tomb and (laughs) it's interesting. He says, show me where the tomb is. And Jesus saw her, then Mary comes out, right? Mary comes out. Yeah. 
uh, the other sister. And she's also like, Jesus, if you had been here, he wouldn't have died. And she's weeping and all the people are weeping. And, and then Jesus wept when he saw all the people weeping. When and that's important. That's super important. Right. So it tells us that God is in tune with the heart of man. Yeah. But also he himself is in tune with his humanity. Yeah. His heart could be moved to tears out of love exactly. for his friend, even though he knew what he was about to do. So then um, basically what happens is Jesus commands that they roll away the stone. He prays to his heavenly father. He thanks the father in advance for listening to his prayer. Mm. And then he says, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus comes out. Of, they roll back the stone. Everyone's kind of freaking out because they're like, dude, he's been dead for four days. It's going to spell. It's going to smell by now. But Jesus is like, no, roll back the stone. Lazarus comes out and then he commands the friends to untie the linens that were wrapped around Lazarus and get him some food. I believe he says, yeah, that's right. And, um, so that's the miracle. And that's what this art piece is portraying. That's what it's depicting. Um, so if you're seeing the art piece now, you're seeing the moment in which the friends of Lazarus and, and his sisters are heeding the Lord's command to unwrap his, his the, the burial cloths and uh, ushering Lazarus back into a state of life. So without, so I guess after with that background in mind, this is kind of the story. Maybe you've heard it before, but this is what Caravaggio is depicting in this image. So, okay. What, what are the themes that Caravaggio is drawing out in his depiction of this image? Because plenty of artists had drawn and yeah. painted this biblical scene before. And many of, you know, we all, hopefully those listening have been at least to some extent exposed to this biblical passage, yeah. um, which again here is being trying to portray. And I think I want to go back to one of the last points you made that I think is a theme that we see first kind of shouting out mm-hmm. from this painting, namely the lighting. The lighting situation of this painting is interesting because it's coming, if you're looking at the painting from left to right. Mm-hmm. Caravaggio does this, even, for example, the calling of St. Matthew. Yeah, it's similar. Right? There's light coming from the window. From behind exactly. Christ, right? Yeah. And so here you have that kind of same play on colors, on art. There's a light coming from behind Christ into the miraculous event. Mm-hmm. Um, Christ is pointing and showing, revealing the power of the Son through the Father. Right? And so you, I think the big theme is that you see this this union between the Father and the Son, which in your last point you had mentioned, Christ thanked him. Yeah. Right? For this moment, Christ thanked his Father, the Father, for, for this ability. And throughout the miracles, um, in John, there is that recognition yes. of the Son coming forth from the Father and this being done in the name of the Father. Right? Yes. And I think that's one of the first things that we should recognize is that Caravaggio is not unintentionally just making places brighter right, in right. the painting. I think that it's, it's important to, to paint, to, to get in the mind of the artist and say, and think what truth is he trying to portray? I think one of the first themes we see here is unity between the father and the right, son. Yeah. Cause the light is coming from behind and above Christ, right? It's almost like yeah. coming from above and flowing through him mm-hmm. onto the figure of Lazarus. And if you notice, and Joey and I had a, had a discussion about this before recording. Some of the people are looking to the left of the painting. Yeah. Which is interesting because it, it at least calls to my mind, are they looking at Christ or are they looking at the light? It looks like they're looking at the light. It looks like they're looking at the, the source of the light. Which is why Christ came. It was to reveal the Father, right? Mm-hmm. So it's, th- And this is the purpose of all the signs that he performs right. in, John, in all the Gospels and right. throughout all of his life. It's, it's to reveal his own divinity, right? To make known that he and the Father are one. He says the Son can do nothing without the Father, yeah. right? But only, he only does what he sees the Father doing. Mm-hmm. So everything that Jesus does is done in complete filial dependence on God. And God and he are act. He is God. But the Father, I should say, complete filial dependence upon the Father. And he and the father are always acting together and Caravaggio is portraying this. Yeah. Like you said, with this light in the painting, which is so beautifully done. Yeah. So I think that's one of the first profound truths we see depicted in this piece of art. Um, the and can I say, obviously, so Christ is the son of God. He's the logos, but he's also the model for us, mm-hmm. right? We're supposed to become to be a Christian is to be another Christ is to become like Christ. And if Christ is never doing anything except through dependence on and union with his heavenly father, that's our vocation as well. We're called to be sons in the sun sons. Yes, exactly. Sons or daughters in the sun. That's right. Um, we, so this, 
and Christ, you'll, you'll hear this like in the, in the last supper, Jesus says to his disciples. So he says, as the father has sent me, so I send you, right? So there's an analogous relationship between Jesus and the father and between, um, Jesus and his disciples, right? So Jesus was sent into the world by the father and he does everything out of that union with the father, all of his works, like the raising of Lazarus, yeah. like his passion, death and resurrection come from his union with the father. So two Christians are sent out into the world by Christ as the father has sent me. So I send you and we Christians, we're supposed to do everything we do out of our union with Christ, right? Mm-hmm. It's out of our fundamental relationship with him. That's the, that becomes the source of all our activity. He says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Without me, you can do nothing. And this is, this is the point. And, and in fact, and I'll make this last point, we can move on to another theme we drew out. But, I mean, our very existence is not something we created. Yeah. Like, and I think that's an important and humble reality we need to learn to acknowledge as human beings. That we did not create ourselves. That we were given existence. Whether we wanted it or not. We exist. We're here. And that's a gift, objectively so. And I think that points back to this truth, that we come forth from some, not something, someone, Mm -hmm. right? Someone that seeks relationship with us, we would say God. Yeah. And if we're going to flourish as the types of things that we are, as created beings, we can't do that by trying to live independent, autonomous lives. We have to live... D- completely and utterly dependent upon the Father on, in every moment. Right. Joey, you had drawn a second point that I thought was very fascinating. Um, and also, by the way, we forgot to mention this at the beginning. There's an article that Joey is, is uh, using yeah, that's for some of this reflection. Yeah, that's inspired a lot of my... That's actually how I discovered this painting is I okay. found this article first and it was about this painting. But. Yeah. And so we'll, we'll link that below. But one of the other themes that I thought Joey, via this article pointed out was was fantastic i think you should tell our listeners okay so another thing that i think caravaggio is doing in this painting is he's depicting the reality of ongoing conversion in the life of the believer that conversion from sin salvation from death to life is a process and you see it in the body of lazarus by the way yeah i I think you see this depicted in in the life of in the body of Lazarus, he's kind of alive, but kind of not. He's kind of in his, in his right mind, kind of in his senses, but he's also still not fully alive. Yeah. So the article points out that other art artists, artistic depictions of this scene were much more inclined to portray Lazarus already having been freed from his burial cloths, right? Lazarus is out. He's standing erect. He is, he's freed. He's back to life. Mm. Caravaggio depicts Lazarus in this kind of state of, halfway right he's he's being resuscitated in this image his burial cloths are still halfway on him they're still being unbound by the people he loves Mm -hmm. right if you look at his arms one of his arms is pointing up towards the light towards the father towards jesus another one of the and his other arm is pointing downwards towards and you can actually see caravaggio puts a skull in the painting right so there's this even there's this internal battle Within Lazarus himself, he's he's reaching both towards heaven and towards the earth. He's he's there's this struggle being depicted within him of this fight within himself between life and death. And can I also just draw out the fact that the Gospel of John actually has this deep tension constantly. Yeah, it's a theme throughout out the gospel. Out of all the right? gospels, the Gospel of John talks about these contrasts: light and darkness. Yeah, heaven and earth. Yeah, right, life and death. Mm-hmm. And so I wonder if... Oh, Caravaggio knew that. I, so, going back to your point, yeah. right? This wasn't just an artist um, in the loose sense of the term. This is a theologian. This was a thinking creative. Yeah, and why is this important? Because Lazarus, he's... This is a real historical event that happened. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. But that's also an image that is... Um, it's an image that is analogous to the Christian life in general, right? Mm. So just as Lazarus... Lazarus as the dead man symbolizes people who are dead in their sins, right? So we are all born into this world in a state of original sin, in a state of spiritual death, in a state of separation from God. Yeah. And Jesus, just as he raised Lazarus from the dead, he, he came to give us life. And that comes through primarily baptism. When we're baptized, we receive eternal life 
into us, right? Into our hearts, the indwelling presence of God. Yep. But we're not like Jesus, right? So when Jesus raises from the dead, the burial cloths, boom, they're off of him immediately. See you freaking He's like later. instantaneously back to a new and also their existence. They're folded. We have that like yeah, kind of right. weird so, description. Exactly. He's folded them up and left them on the side of the tomb. Yeah. With Lazarus, that's not the case. Lazarus, it's not instantaneous. And it's also not instantaneous in our lives. So even though Jesus gives us his grace and implants his grace within us at the moment of our baptism, we, like Lazarus in this picture, we still have to struggle throughout mm-hmm. our entire lives to fight towards heaven, right? Yeah. To, to, to the, the, it's an ongoing process of conversion and still the, the remnants of original sin are still kind of infecting our soul and still we're, we're still inclined towards sin and death. Yeah. But we're constantly grasping and moving, trying to reach closer and closer towards the light. And that's, that's where you have here, this tension of Lazarus is kind of split between both ways, mm-hmm. right? And we as humans are uniquely able to we were talking about this in class earlier. We're uniquely able to choose God. Yeah. But we're also uniquely able to choose turning away from him. Yeah. And so <laughs> we are terrifying. Yeah, we're also in this kind of intermediary stage where we're like, we're both of the earth, but not really. We're made for heaven. Mm-hmm. We come from the Father, but we're not in complete union with him yet. Almost but not yet, whole idea. Yes. And in fact the word that already already but not already yet. Already yeah. but not yet, I'm sorry. Um St. Paul, when he uses the word, um, what we in English have translated to salvation, the Greek root, if I'm not mistaken, actually indicates that it's something unfolding before us. It's a, it's a as Joey was saying, it's a process. It's mm-hmm. a becoming something, not something a one and done. Yeah. Where oftentimes our, our partisan brethren will say, you know, one saved, always saved. Yeah, kind of like idea. there's one distinct moment where like, boom, I'm saved. But I think there's a deep theological truth being portrayed in this painting and in John's gospel in general, that in fact, um, salvation is something that happens over time, mm-hmm. right? Why? Well, I think to one extent, it's because we come from a father who knows us and he knows that we're able to choose him and love him as we are able to do so. And the way that man does so is through stages. Yeah. Man exists in time. Exactly. We're temporal creatures. And so the only way that salvation can come about in the creature that is man is over the course of time. It's successively, right? Now, there are obviously exceptions to that rule. That's a good point. Maybe saints receive certain graces or or maybe maybe St. Paul, right? Exactly. Boom. Right. Instant conversion. Boom. But he still wasn't in heaven. No, he still wasn't. And and when he was writing, writing, you you get that sense of urgency in St. Paul. It's like, it's a coming. It's a coming. All all right. Maybe maybe it's coming. All right. Maybe next week. (laughs) All right, guys. Well, we're going to have to set back a little bit because I think it's coming a little later than I was expecting. But this whole point of like, the, the 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 life the the walk of life is is a process of life and death. There's this kind of rising forth, which I think uh, this painting Caravaggio tries to illustrate. In. And the other big point that I want to emphasize for our listeners, especially that's portrayed in John's Gospel, it's portrayed in this painting, and it's what we're basically saying: it's that heaven begins now. Heaven begins here on earth in the moment of your baptism, when grace is given to you when when the Lord claims you as his child, the kingdom of God is within you, Jesus says, right? When the Lord baptizes you and chooses you, when you receive him in the Eucharist, when you receive his grace in baptism, heaven, the reality that you are anticipating at the end of your life, please God, is already present in you, but it's present in, in seed form, we would say. Hmm. So we want to avoid this thinking of like, okay, heaven is after this life. So I just need to suffer through this world, obey all the rules, check all the boxes, and then if I behave and I get good grades, then I'll get to go (laughs) to heaven, right? No, heaven is now. Heaven begins now, but they say that grace is the seed of glory, right? So Mm. this is why Jesus is always talking about seeds, right? He's like, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. Right, it, the kingdom of heaven is, is like a seed that a farmer buries, and it grows, and he knows not how. Right, so Jesus, at the moment of your baptism, or even before your baptism, he's often working in your life. He implants his grace within you to c- draw you to himself, and then he does this gradually over the course of time. And so you, the process, the normal process of conversion in the life of a believer is one of struggling against sin, first getting rid of all the the, the things that are explicitly pulling me away from God. Right. Yeah. Um, and then I start to grow in virtue. I start to desire God more and more. And then hopefully, please God, by the end of our lives, we've reached the point where we are 
ready to be perfected in charity, right? But it, but it is this gradual yeah. process. Good and faithful servants. Yeah. We, we read in John, um, I believe it's actually the first letter of John. Don't quote me on that, friends. But it's you know, that's a phrase, we're no longer slaves but friends, mm-hmm. right? I no longer call you slaves, I call you friends. The verse right after that says, if you follow my commandments. Yeah, if you do so what I tell you. If you yeah. do what I tell you. So there's this tension where like we're on the way and we're already adopted children in the Father, but we're not in full-fledged union with him just yet. And so we do still have to fight against sin. We still have to <laughs> open our hearts to receive more of God's grace, right? But like Caravaggio depicts in the painting, that comes from Jesus Christ. We have to learn to receive that life from Jesus Christ. Yeah, it's nothing we can just do on our own, no. right? It's Christ who comes to us and meets us in that death, right? In that dying state to bring us into his living state. And this is the last point I'll make about this is that the other reason why this is important is that sometimes, I know I myself have struggled sometimes with like, okay, God wants me to be a saint. I know that. And that is true. God wants me to be a saint. He wants you to be a saint. That's what you're created for. God wants me to be a saint, but I'm not a saint. And so I'm, I'm doing something wrong. Like, what am I doing? Like, I got to figure this out. Like I need to be a saint right now. And it's, and it's actually like, not necessarily like God's plan for me is to convert me and draw me to himself over time, gradually. And at the end of my life, I will look back and see all the struggles, all the hardships, all the sufferings, even all the sin that I committed Mm. as stepping stones along the way to the perfection that God was drawing me to in union with him. And that brings me great comfort that I can, that I can trust that God knows what he's doing in my life. That if we just, that if we just continue to try to be faithful to him as, as, as well as we can and, and receptive to his grace, like he'll take care of us, you know? Yeah. Thanks be to God that we don't know everything in a certain way. Yeah. Because what, yeah. what, what would we do with the knowledge of that? Right. We would like to think we'd be open to his love. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I mentioned this on the podcast before, but I had a friend one time kind of angry with God. And he told me, he goes, why doesn't God just appear to me? You know, he, he was doubting God's existence and all stuff. Why, why doesn't God, uh, if he just appeared to me, I'd believe in him and I'd, I'd walk the Christian way. Yeah. And I think it was a movement of the Holy Spirit. I got frustrated with him. I was like, who's to say that's true? Right. Who are you to say that if God Almighty appeared before you, you would just instantly choose him? Now, we would say in the order of grace, that's true. If God appeared to himself to you in full glory, you could do nothing but choose him because his goodness is so resplendent that you would just be inclined to desire him. That's what heaven is. Right. Yeah. But there is also the sense of like our Lord wouldn't force his love upon you that way because that's not the nature of love. And he is love. Mm-hmm. He seeks to draw you into relationship, mm-hmm. not force you into it. He's not waterboarding you into choosing him. Right. Right. Um, he's giving you sips of water to the point to where you love drinking the water. Yeah. He's like you a know? physician who slowly nurses us back to health, right? Yeah. From and, and that again takes, that takes time. That takes Yeah. So that's and all of that to say Caravaggio is tuned into this reality and he's depicting it in this in this um <laughs> in this beautiful painting. So yeah. And there's one other thing I think that we wanted to talk about yeah. that he's depicting in this painting. And that is the fact that not only does salvation and your conversion to holiness take time, but it also takes the help of others. Right. And I think this is an interesting miracle because it mentions others, I think, in a way that um, other miracles are not explicit about, at least that are coming to mind. Yeah. The wedding of Cana is at a wedding, mm-hmm. but this is mentioning particular names. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think just to emphasize that point in a certain way, it's like, hey, it, tur- it turns out that this process of death to life uh, requires others, others so, who love you. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And and what does it require of them? Well, it requires their faith, right? So mm. it turned out it was actually the faith of Martha and Mary. Mm-hmm. It was the faith of Lazarus's sisters that prompted Jesus to perform the miracle. They came to him asking for help. They came to him confessing their belief that they could ra- that he could raise their brother from That's the right. dead. And it was that faith, and it was nothing Lazarus did. Lazarus was dead. It was that faith that prompted the miracle, right? And so the obvious analogy to this is our own baptism. Most of us were baptized when we were babies. We were 
dead in original sin, spiritually separated from the Father, and we were babies. We were, as our as our uh, teacher would say, we were stupid. <laughs> no, you were stupid. <laughs> we, we didn't have the use. I of came reason. out just speaking, <laughs> just full just fledged reciting Shakespeare. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> In Spanish. How are that? Yeah, in Spanish. I don't even know how that would sound like in Spanish. Kind of scary, probably. It sounds scary in English, but much more in Spanish. Uh, but all that to say, when you the, the odds are when you were baptized, you were not the one who confessed your faith in Jesus Christ. Mm-mm. It was probably your parents. It was your parents who confessed faith on your behalf. And because of their faith, Jesus came and adopted you as his beloved son or daughter. And I want to go back to a point that I emphasized earlier to hammer on this this point of the mm-hmm. need for a community. You know, creation is a gift. Yeah. Um, we say it comes from the Father. But parts of that cause are also your parents. Yeah. Okay. So life also comes from, again, the other, lowercase o other, your parents. Um, again, whether it, whether it is a mistake, whether it who knows how you came into this world. I don't presume to know, but I do know that you do exist. And I do know that existence happens because biologically a male and a female get in, enter the conjugal act and a person is now in, in reality. Okay. Um, but this reality that you're handed down is a gift and you're able to experience this thing we call reality because it was something that was given to you. And there's this quote that we've mentioned several times on this podcast and we can never hear it enough. Um, it was by St. Peter. Faith comes from what is heard. Yeah. Right. Faith comes from what is heard. Now, how does that relate to what I mentioned earlier? Well, that relates because we're living now in a reality that enables us to hear things, to see things, to taste things. And so we're given a faith. We hear from hearing faith comes through hearing because it's also something that's received. So we're entering into reality and then we're proposed the truths of the faith through our hearing, through the sensations we first received when we came into existence. So everything we're receiving, guys, is a gift and particularly the faith. And why is the faith so dependent on a community? Because it turns out that our identity to some extent depends on that community Mm -hmm. because it was first given to us there and we were raised within a family within a society, within a kingdom. And so all of our existence, maybe the traditions we hold, good or bad, habits, good or bad, all of this thing we call our existence is kind of given to us, right? And yes, we have some say in it, and yes, we have some choice in it, right? By the grace of God, we have free will. All that to say, however, that faith also happens to be a portion of, of the gift of creation, of the gift of existence. Yeah, God doesn't want to save any of us by ourselves. No. We are persons, which means we are relational beings. We necessarily exist in a community and from a community and with a community. And everything we have, in a very St. Paul says, what do you have that you have not received? Mm -hmm. Ultimately from God, but then also from your family, from your parents, from your community. And faith is one of those things. So a lot of times people think, well, I am... I believe in Jesus. I believe in God. And like, I'm the source of that. And it's like, no, you're not. That was actually a gift that was given to you by God, oftentimes through your parents, oftentimes in Lazarus's case, through your sisters, right? Like, um, and the whole point is that God set it up like that because he didn't want you to just come to him by yourself. He wanted you to come to him with your family, with your friends, with your community, he wanted to. He wants to save all of us. God wills that all men be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Right, That's right. says Saint Paul in the letter of Timothy. So, letter to Timothy. Um, so, not only is the beginning of eternal life in baptism and like the the, the faith that we receive uh, dependent on the help of others, but also our ongoing conversion right. is dependent on the help of others. If I'm going to grow in virtue, if I'm going to be like Lazarus and reaching, to, if I'm going to reach towards the light. And if I'm going to have my burial cloths taken off of me throughout my life, I actually need the help of other people who are fighting that same battle. What is what we hear in Scripture in this narrative? Loosen him and let him go. Yeah. Right? Right. So that's exactly right. Jesus commands Lazarus to come out. Yeah. But then he also commands the his sisters and his friends, unba- unbound uh. him, untie him, and let him go. So there's a responsibility on the part of the community, too, to help the man who is undergoing conversion mm-hmm. to come back from death to life. Right, So God calls you personally, but he also calls you personally to depend on others. 
and to be uh, dependent upon by others, right? And to untie others' burial cloths even as they untie yours. Mm. So, and there's, I mean, there's that kind of commandment, right? Love your neighbor right? as you love yourself. The two great commandments. I mean, that's it. Love God above all and love your neighbor as yourself. But again, it's because the truth of that is faith, that is a person, um, is not meant for you alone. It's meant to be deeply, deeply intertwined with a community of believers. And that's what we say heaven is. Yeah. It's a heaven of believers glorifying. It's a banquet. God. It's a banquet. We're partying hard. It's a hard. party, dude. And parties and are lame if you're by yourself. That's true. And God isn't by himself. God is three. Mm. Strictly speaking, he's one, but he's also three. He's a community. <laughs> and we image him as a community. I thought you were going to get into Trinitarian theology. I, I was like, I am not ready. But um, <laughs> also, practically speaking, what does this mean? Okay, so we need other people to help us undo our burial cloths. We need other people to help us reach towards the light and not towards the skull. That means hang out with people who are virtuous. Yep. That means choose your friends wisely. Choose your community. If you're, they, I mean, this is a saying that's common in the secular world as well as the religious world. Like, you are who your friends are. Like, yeah. Who are your five best friends? That's who you are. It's like, and it's true. Like, so the people you associate with, the people who you travel on this journey with, they're going to have such a big influence on you. And they can be, they can either wrap you in burial cloths and send you back into the tomb, or they can actually, like Martha and Mary in this picture, unbind you mm. and lead you into virtue, lead you closer to the light, which is the Lord. Or, you or you know, you, you could have friends like Mary and Martha who go to Jesus Christ first imploring his name upon this catastrophe that has yeah, happened. for your sake, yeah. Right? And so you can be that friend too. You can be the Martha and Mary of the Lazarus in your own life and imploring Christ to come and heal said person, whatever it may be. Um, and he may very well have some miraculous healing, right? But implore his name. Be the friend too. Go looking for friends, but also be that friend. Mm-hmm. And I'm also thinking of another story in the gospel where the, the friends bring the paralytic on the stretcher to oh, Jesus. Right. They open up the roof and they drop him down through the roof because there's not enough room because of the crowds. That's a similar situation of these friends who loved this man who was paralyzed, who could do nothing for himself. Mm-hmm. They brought him to the Lord. If there's someone in your life, a child, a friend, who's far from the Lord, you can be like Martha and Mary. You can be like those friends who brought the man on the stretcher. You can go to Jesus and your faith is powerful. And it will, yeah. our Lord, <laughs> our Lord has a weakness for those who approach him in confidence. And when you do that, he will often rush to your aid. So, yeah. And going back to the painting, I mean, that's really and even if you look at the disposition of Martha and Mary in the painting, you can tell that they're, I don't know which one's Martha and which one's Mary. I'm going to be honest it's with true, you. Nor, neither do I. Right. But whoever the woman on the top is, she has a more of a disposition of like smile. Uh-huh. She's content with what's happening. Whereas the woman closer to Lazarus's lips is trying to listen for his breath. She's probably a little more worried, more anxious. Um, which makes me think the first one is Mary because she's the contemplative, anxious. right? Yeah. And Martha is the one who's anxious. Anxious, and to, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, again, maybe another truth we just dispelled in trying to, uh, to, to depict this, this piece. But, yeah, I, I, you know, I think if we can use those three themes that we've drawn out to reflect on this painting and reflect on our own lives and how our relationship stands with, with God, I think we'll have enough food for thought and uh, hopefully conforming our hearts to the Lord. Can I do a Father Dylan James and summarize those three themes again? Hit it. The first one, Jesus Christ is God. He's completely united to the Heavenly Father and you're called to be united to Him as He's united to God. Although you can't strictly do that the exact same way because you're not God, but you know what I mean. Secondly, um, conversion is a process. Yeah. The seed of glory has been implanted within you at baptism. But it unfolds. But it unfolds over time and Mm -hmm. it's supposed to flourish throughout your life. And number three, Faith requires a community. Faith requires a community. It's given as a gift from others, and it requires the help of others if it's going to reach its fulfillment. Yeah. Guys. Caravaggio, what a beast, man. He's a beast. I'm telling y'all, check this guy out. Check our outlet. Beauty and these artistic forms transform your life because they will. They possessed me, 
and they've changed my life and I hope they do the same to you and I think Joey could speak to the same yeah it's arts all right all right guys well I hope y'all let this art pierce your heart and uh thank y'all for tuning into this episode of logos podcast we hope y'all learned something and above all we hope y'all grew closer to our Lord Jesus Christ and as always God bless